Hi there. This is Megan Raymond with WCET. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Issues and Trends in EdTech. We are thrilled to have you here. As we go through, if you have any questions, go ahead and answer, or excuse me, enter them into the question box. We'll be keeping an eye on that, and then if we need to jump in and interrupt our panelists, we'll do so. Otherwise, we'll hold all questions until the last part of the webinar. You can access the PowerPoint slides by clicking download in the handouts pane. This is being recorded and we'll be sure to send you a link as well as any resources that were shared and the recording uh, within, within the week. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you want to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast. As we go through today, we'll do brief introductions. We'll reflect on EdTech trends in 2016, a conversation around EdTech trends and issues in 2017, and then we hope to have plenty of time for audience Q&A. Again, go ahead and enter your questions into the chat box, and we hope to have 15 to 20 minutes to get to those questions. In addition to being the overall manager of this webinar today, I also get to jump in and be the moderator. So I'm tasked with keeping on top of all of your fabulous questions and wrangling our panel today. We have an exceptional group of panelists today, and I'll let them do, do their self-introductions momentarily, but we have Amy Collier from Middlebury College, Luke Dowden, who's on the WCET Executive Council from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, Phil Wires from Mind Wires Consulting, and Manoj Kulkarni from Realize It. You can see all of their Twitter handles there as well, and those will be visible again. So I'd like to jump right in and ask our panelists to go ahead and do brief introductions, and then we'll get to the first question. So Amy, let's start with your introduction. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Amy Collier, and as you saw, I am the Associate Provost for Digital Learning at Middlebury. It's a relatively new position at Middlebury. I've been here about a year and a half. And ultimately, I guess I would characterize my job as um, helping to build the right um, team and the right organization to support digital exploration across the entire institution of Middlebury. It's, it's more than just an undergraduate college. There's a lot going on here. And um, to help Middlebury think through its digital learning strategy, what should we be doing with digital and not? So that's me. Wonderful. Thanks, Amy. And Luke. Hi, I'm Luke Dowden. I'm the director of the Office of Distance Learning at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I uh, was the founding director seven years ago, so I'm celebrating my seven-year anniversary uh, this month uh, and have enjoyed uh, building our, our team here. We have a team of uh, now eight um, and three areas, uh, faculty, support, um, student relations and our business management. We were asked a year and a half ago to become a self-support unit uh, and I'm happy to say today we're 85% uh, self-support. So um, have learned a lot about business as that's not my uh, background, my background's in education. But I look forward to being a panelist today. Thank you Luke. Phil Hill? You might be on mute Phil. Hi, I'm Phil Hill uh, with uh, MindWires Consulting and also with uh, the eLiterate blog and, you know, been covering uh, ed tech trends and what's going on in the market for about uh, 12 years. Uh, great, uh, it's great to see the panelists here, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation myself. Excellent. And Manoj? Uh, good day, everyone. Um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be on the on the panel. Um, I'm the CEO of Realize It. I've been in education for about a decade, and in technology for about three decades. You know, across different industries, um, and you know, I've been both inside an institution, being an ed tech consumer, and now I'm playing the role of being an ed tech provider um, with Realize It, which is um, personalized learning and adaptive learning. Um, and I'm very excited to be on the panel. Um, Luke, congratulations. 
I'm really looking forward to, um, to participating on this panel. Excellent. Thank you, panelists. So I'd like to jump into the first question, which is what this slide is relevant to, is when we look back at 2016, to you, what was the biggest overhyped ed tech trend or tech in ed trend in 2016? Let's start with you, Luke. Thanks, Megan. I don't know if, if the trend I picked fits in either category of overhyped, um, but I think the jury's still out on the investments that were made in boot camps. I don't know if you all watched, but I did in amazement. I get an update from Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle every day is multi-million dollar deals were made to acquire, I'm going to call them mom and pop shops. Um, and and one, uh, one person that wasn't directly involved in the acquisition told me that for their institution it was a, a strategic opportunity to really advance something that was core to their, their mission. But, you know, I think the jury's still out, Megan, and, and I'm interested in what the other panelists think, but I'm really interested to see how the investments on boot camps play out in the next 18 months. Um, and so I wouldn't, I'm, I'm sorry that it's in the overhyped. I didn't know where else to put it. I think it's the things that keep me wondering and wish I knew more about. Excellent. I want to just add to that, um, Luke, because uh, I, I, I'm really interested in this idea of the investments that have been made in kind of these alternative schooling, um, boot camps, um, uh, on college kinds of things. Uh, and I think, um, it's, it, I, would, I would consider it to be related to kind of the broader trend in unbundling. Um, so unbundling is something that you have probably seen touted by uh, people talking about MOOCs or talking about other ed tech trends where they, they say, well, you know, what we need to be thinking about is the ways in which you can modularize uh, things that happen in higher education, higher education experiences, so that then these modular bits can be provided at lower costs by alternate providers and students can get to a sum of parts that looks like what they need for their, for their workforce preparation. And I, it's one of those things, um, especially coming from a liberal arts perspective, but I think in general when we start to talk about the purpose of education, you have to wonder and question whether or not the modularization of higher education into these unbundled bits that can be provided by uh, multiple providers is really what's best for our students. Uh, it's something I certainly question. Um, and, and I think boot camps relate to that because you, you see the investment in boot camps uh, being tied to this idea of um, unbundling the, the credential, right? To take it out of the, the residential experience, to take it out of a mentored experience and a holistic liberal arts experience and just say, well, it's workforce preparation towards a specific thing and we can give that really cheaply to students. Um, and it's just, it's an area of, of major concern that I have. And I'd love to, to keep chatting about that with the, with the panel about um, the ways in which unbundling is detrimental to uh, students and to higher education um, and how it relates to some of the other ed tech trends we've seen. So if I can just add this, who knows, if I can just add in there, and I don't really have a good answer to that because when I talk about, when you say overhype, and I really don't know the difference between hype and overhype, um, but, you know, a hype is when it promises something and it doesn't deliver it. I honestly don't think that, you know, in education things can move that fast that you can actually test out the hypothesis of, of the promise within a year. So I think if anything we're looking at is what were some of the things that were promised two, three years ago that people have been really testing and working on it and hasn't delivered on it. As, as Luke said, and I agree whether it is um, MOOCs or uh, whether it is boot camps or whatever it is, you know, the jury is out on a lot of these things. So in many ways, almost a lot of it seems to be hype. Right, and this is Megan, and I just want to jump in, Manoj, specifically to you and say, in reflecting on the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report from 2016, they were saying that adaptive learning was really, within the next one to three years, we would see a lot more adoption. Is, is that, has that held true? I think in some of our conversations, we think uh, 
there was a lot more expectation that we would be further along than we are. Yeah, I think so. And um, I think if we look at it, I, I, I mean, I'd be interested in hearing. I've been inside an institution where I've made it happen, and now I'm, you know, outside the institution and looking at some of the barriers. And I would say that the timeline in terms of three years for something to happen with adaptive learning sounds about right. Uh, we're beginning to see a growing interest in it. There's a lot of confusion. Um, so when we really look at the people that we work with, around it, it falls into two buckets. People who understand the digital shift that's happening and want to do something about it. And it's really about understanding how to eliminate the barriers. There's no dearth of people who are going to supply. What's really important is understanding what is needed to transform, to adapt to some of these things. And certainly the proof points that are necessary from an efficacy standpoint are still being worked out in, in a broader context. Um, so while we've been encouraged in terms of progressive institutions and early adopter institutions, not only testing it out but sort of expanding it to scale, in terms of um, its ability to scale and be broadly defined, I think we are still looking at um, a slow growth in terms of how that comes about. Now, having said that, what we look at is really the enterprise um, sort of adoption associated with it. In, in parks, there are lots of providers who are providing adaptive learning. The challenge in 2016 has really been to parse out and understand what does it really mean and where does it adapt and what is it really applied to. Uh, and the challenge with higher education or anything particularly in technology is two words are applied for a full category that is so broad that it becomes difficult for people to understand it. So a lot of it has really been about understanding awareness and comprehension, building that, and, and working with folks to do that. I still think that the horizon is, is, is in the two to three year time frame to, to see more proof points and efficacies. Um, but in terms of mass adoption, uh, that's something for us to wait and watch. Uh, thank you for that, Manoj. I'm going to jump to Phil Hill. I'd like to hear from you. What, what did you see as the biggest hype or overhyped tech trend in 2016? Well, just to try to make Manoj uncomfortable, I was definitely going to go into the um, adaptive learning realm. But more specifically, it, it's really adaptive learning as a silver bullet or as a magic technology. And I think he makes a very good point about it's it's a broad term and you know if if you view adaptive learning as using magic software algorithms that will automatically figure out what students need to have, as opposed to it's something that can help be a tool within the context of a classroom, within a specific context guided by either teachers or coaches or whoever's appropriate. So if you look at it as sort of the magic bullet, I think that's been the most overhyped trend that's starting, it's actually causing a lot of the confusion that's out there. But I actually see a similar uh, trend as the unbundling conversation. Going back to Amy's point about unbundling, you know, I could argue that uh, College for America at Southern New Hampshire University, the entire program design is based on uh, unbundling and rethinking it, and then they happen to use competency-based education as a solution, but they have a very specific usage in mind, a specific student group in mind. It's for workforce development, particularly of mid-career people who want to advance themselves. And so within that, that context, it works extremely well. Where it becomes overhyped and loses its power is where people say, aha, that applies broadly. You know, it's worked in one context. Now let's just apply that idea across education and make it work. So I yeah. sort of see those two as, as the same, where if you take something out of context and try to scale it and extrapolate it to places where it might not make sense, that's where you get into the hype and the problem. And I, I actually totally agree with you there. And, you know, I think the, the problem that I see with the ways in which um, something like unbundling has been overhyped and generalized is that that's where you're seeing all the investment of, of money um, going into educational technology companies that support the idea of unbundling um, any higher education experience. And what it does is it devalues a lot of things that I actually would say we should hold pretty dear to, 
Um, it, it can de devalue the, the role of the teacher. It can devalue the role of a, a more holistic approach to education. Um, and, and it can create a situation where we are, we are only looking at education in terms of very narrow, specific outcomes. Um, and being able to say, well, the, you know, that can be unbundled over here, and you can add that plus this and get that. Um, and it becomes a really, really um, limiting way of thinking about education and not taking in the intangibles, the serendipities, the things that are really difficult to look at when you're talking about an unbundled education. Yeah, I, I, uh, Megan, can I just add a, a comment on unbundling? Please do, um, and then we'll move on to the next question. Okay. You know, the thing about unbundling is it, it's the, the thing that happens with almost ed tech, and I do agree with, with Phil that technology has looked at a magic bullet, and in 30 years of my life, I've never seen any technology actually be a magic bullet. Plus, when you add, you know, the institutional practices and the tradition associated with it, there almost is a rush to say, what is that technology that or practice that can change it? Unbundling in certain cases is an option. It's not a replacement for what people do today. So done right, it has the ability to provide options to those uh, who need it. But it's not something that is, that is, you know, for mass scale adoption at this point in time. And I would say the same thing about, you know, although I do believe, you know, in terms of the adaptive learning aspects of it, you know, having mass scale, but it's not technology, it's adaptive learning environments, it's figuring out how to be student-centric, it's understanding how to redesign the classroom, it's understanding the, the role of the teachers, it's making it fit in the ecosystem, whether it's un unbundled or as opposed to saying, let's forget this ecosystem and build a completely new ecosystem. That is unrealistic. Excellent responses. Let's move on to 2017. We're already, what, 19 days into the new year. Let's talk about what you as panelists anticipate as trends or issues will impact our higher ed institutions and our students in 2017. Um, I'm going to jump to you on this one, Luke. Well, I, I think the discussion previous to this was uh, excellent, and one of the things that I, I really think Amy was trying to get at, and Amy, feel free to correct me, is that if you adopt this narrative around different innovative technologies and trends, and you don't apply it to culture and context, you run this danger of preventing more people from crossing the chasm of innovation. And people that are, are like me, and we're working at a more traditional institution, uh, that you're trying to get people to try new things, when there's a narrative out there that talks about we don't need faculty in, and we need to reduce cost, and we need to commodify education, it, it actually makes our jobs harder. And so I would say be cautious about just adopting a narrative and make sure, as Phil said, you're aware of the, the culture and context. In terms of the challenges that we're facing, um, w one thing that I'm excited about, Megan, is that I think learning analytics is coming of age. And I'm seeing companies that, that we've uh, attempted to partner with uh, that are really starting to say, here are our results. Here's what we learned. Here's how we applied it. And here were the results. You know, that's in, in the world of accreditation, it's closing the loop. And I'm most exciting about, I think 2017 is the year of learning analytics coming of age, like truly coming of age. And, and going back to, um, you know, whatever other panelists had, had said about it takes two or three years. And, and looking at the NMC Hot Horizons report from last year, 2016, where they talked about uh, adoption of learning analytics. I, I, I'm going to be a little bold there, and, and maybe I'm off key, but I, I see a lot of maturing of those investments that were made several years ago. I think the biggest thing facing administrators is we're still uh, tasked with proving that online learning is legitimate. And it's legitimate in the in the place that you are educating the person you think you're educating. Uh, and as we're challenged more uh, with that question, we're going to look more and more, I think, at um, uh, bioinformatics uh, and collecting that type of data on students. Uh, and I'm not as concerned about collecting it. I'm concerned about what gets done with it. How does it get stored? How long does it get stored? And, and what is the potential misuse of, of biometric data? Um, and and I'm, that's something that keeps me up at night. Uh, as from an administrator, I was asked to kind of take this administrative look. So uh, sorry to kind of answer a previous question and another question, but uh, that's the thing that keeps me up at night. Excellent, Luke. And I, I agree. I really think we're to the point now where there's not so much 
questioning around where do we even get started with the data initiative is now what to do with the data that we've collected. So I, I would agree with you on that. Phil, let's jump to you. What do you see will be impacting our companies and how our institutions work with them? Um, well, I realize there's a risk of me sounding Pollyanna-ish as if all things are well, but um, I think one of the biggest things to watch for are colleges and universities and systems taking ownership of their own innovation programs. And I'll use two specific examples, one of which I've consulted on, one of which I've written about quite a bit. Um, in California, uh, we had the infamous Senate Bill 520 that was uh, passed several years ago, which got somewhat falsely equated as a MOOC bill, as let's bring in MOOC providers to provide online education for the California public systems. Uh, that really got stopped in its tracks through some political fighting. But what's interesting that came out of that is was government funding for the system saying, okay, then you have to innovate in online learning specifically to help students get through their, you know, to get their credentials, degrees, success quicker. And the program that I've worked on has been the online education initiative with the California Community Colleges. And that's a fascinating example because they're owning it themselves. They're trying to be, they're not rejecting innovation. They're saying, hey, this we're responsible for doing this. And that means we've got to put a lot of things in place, common infrastructure, uh, support, tutoring. You know, we need to think holistically. So in California, with that case, it's switched from let's bring in outside vendors to solve this sort of online education to, okay, we're responsible and we need to innovate and really push the boundaries owned by the school. And they're working with vendors, but they own it and they're responsible for it. And I'll mention one other example that's quite interesting to watch, and that's the University of Florida Online. When that first got announced, it was uh, driven by the state legislature with very unrealistic enrollment goals because they felt that you know, we can get all kinds of out-of-state students that pay the higher tuition, and this will be a massive moneymaker. Um, so driven from outside political forces, then they had an online program management uh, partner uh, that was going to do most of the work for them. And things started falling apart for various reasons, but that's another case where it's been an interesting twist. University of Florida Online has not gone away. What they did is they they modified their model. They're still working with providers in different ways, but they're taking the ownership themselves. And one of the biggest things the internal group did is they said, let's set some realistic enrollment targets. And, oh, by the way, we're already cash neutral, so we're not costing money. And now let's just grow it organically and serve the students who need the online program. So I'm not saying everything's solved, but that's another fascinating case where the school, the system, is taking ownership of the changes. They're still working with technology providers, but they're responsible and they're trying to innovate. So that's going to be messy. I'm sure there are going to be mistakes even by the two groups I've mentioned. But I think it's a really big trend, particularly as we can't come out of the MOOC age and where there's so much focus on MOOCs and various VC-backed technology companies. I think we need to put a lot more focus on where the schools are leading the innovation, what works, what doesn't work, and how do, do the dynamics change just because they're the ones driving and taking ownership themselves. So that's a big trend that I think is the most interesting to me moving forward. Indeed. I think you raised some really good points there, Phil, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, even just from a funding standpoint, how many institutions are going to have to take ownership and, and build on what they've already developed. Um, let's jump to well, you, Manoj. So and how do you... And to be fair, just a comment on that. To be fair, uh, it, it's nice that the online education initiative is getting to do this with additional funding of some, you know, 50 to $70 million. That's a very real aspect of it. So, But it's something right. to really watch. Right. Manoj, let's jump to you, and I know um, this probably touched on some key points for you and whether or not a lot of these moves are putting the students first or our institutions first. 
You know, I, so let me just bridge the one that Phil was mentioning and, and where we do. What we find, and you know, in terms of the trends in 2017, we are beginning to see institutions, you know, recognizing that they need to take more control of what innovation means to them. There are people who believe that online is is a 10-year-old problem to solve, and there are people who believe it's a brand new problem to solve. So it's very contextual to the institution, but at the end of the day, the institution has to take control over it, and we really look at um, at that from a readiness perspective in terms of how we engage with people because we have phenomenal examples of people who have been extremely strategic, understand the resourcing, know the alignment, know what the barriers are, and work with it. Um, and we're working with great institutions to do that, and then there are others who really are not on that. So there is a maturity curve for institutions in terms of where they are in terms of adopting tech in ed for what context. Um, and although the intention is always there for the student, um, I would say that the, that the, the, the challenges that institutions faced are more first for, you know, we need to make sure that we address some of the foundational issues, you know, online, you know, having the right infrastructure, accessibility, security, privacy, so um, while the intention is there, you know, you, and you have to, we have to sell through the institution to the, the value proposition, which is ultimately to the teachers and the students, um, it, it feels a little bit like institutions first because legitimately they have, you know, many foundational issues to take care of before they can even think about transforming the classroom, before they can think about, you know, making it uh, broader in terms of the context. It's, 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 it's both. Um, but where we find the the best adoption is when institutions really understand and are prepared to it to make students first associated with it. There are many cases where institutions are trying to solve their problems first for themselves before it tries to get to to the students. So trying to be a little controversial in here in terms of how we see the stuff from a readiness standpoint, um, we truly believe that institutions have to be ready to, it's, I'm echoing what, what Phil is saying, how you do that, I'm not trying to prescribe it, but at the end of the day, institutions have to be ready to a, accept the fact that there is a shift, a digital shift. They have to be a part of it, and they have to organize and fund and resource themselves to be able to make that happen. Excellent, and I know our panelists are eager to have a conversation around that topic, but before we jump into the conversation piece, I want to get to Amy and hear what trends she anticipates will be impacting our institutions and our students this year? Well, I think we would be, um, we would be missing a conversation opportunity if we didn't mention that it's, I feel like it's clear that our institutions are going to be impacted and continue to be impacted by the political climate of the new administration coming in. Um, I think the, based on, on the um, choice of uh, Secretary of Education uh, based on some of the, the campaign promises that were made by the incoming administration, universities are going to have hard times ahead, uh, both from a funding perspective and from the political climate that you're going to see on college campuses continuing to be uh, strained. And um, you, would, you can expect that, that the kind of social un unrest that is happening on a large scale across our country um, we're going to see happening in various um, ways on our, our, our college campuses, and that's going to be something we have to deal with. Uh, privatization, I think, is going to be a, a big um, a force with this new administration that we're going to have to deal with, that there's going to be increasing pressures to outsource things to private companies that could be done by higher education institutions, kind of bucking the trend that Phil was just talking about, which I actually agree is a, is a positive trend. Um, but one that could actually be um, thwarted or, or um, uh, slowed by the new administration. Um, so I think that's something we need to be aware of. Uh, for, in terms of the impact for our students, or the impact of all this on our work, I would say one of the things that we need to be aware of, and something that we haven't had a lot of conversations, I don't think, as much on our campuses as we should, is that we have to realize that the technology tools that we expose our students to are sometimes risky in terms of their privacy and their intellectual property 
and you know who knows maybe even their own personal security and um, you know I, I came face to face with this as here at Middlebury we started having discussions about becoming a sanctuary school uh, and a sanctuary school is a school that um, opposes and resists um, uh, any um, uh, uh, any strategies that a government might take to try to uh, deport or otherwise harm uh, students who are uh, whose immigration status is um, um, either a question or um, not considered legal and um, one of the questions I had as we were talking about that that notion of, of Middlebury becoming a sanctuary school one of the questions I had was what would that mean to be a sanctuary school what does that mean for the, the systems that we put our students data into uh, what does that mean for um, any of the technology tools that we use in our classroom and being able to protect our students um, from the ways in which that data might be used against them for you know the purposes of, of whatever might come down the road um, so that was something that um, I, I've been thinking a lot about lately and I think we'll, we'll have to be thinking about as campuses um, in the future the other thing I would say is you know as Phil was talking about many campuses taking ownership and control of their innovation portfolios. One of the things that I'm, I worry about a little bit, and I've started to see this at some institutions some, um, where colleagues are working, is that you know, maybe as a result of MOOCs or maybe as just a result of greater attention to digital learning that MOOCs provided, um, lots of institutions invested more heavily in their in-house innovation programs and I thought that was a, a really exciting moment um, and what I'm seeing now is that a lot of those institutions are now pulling back that a little bit maybe not that they're pulling back their investment but, but they're pulling back their um, exploratory vision they're they're kind of pulling back on the the idea of innovation to be more centered uh, more towards the center and um, I've seen people and, and organizations that I would respect that I respect very much who you know, challenge the status quo and who ask critical questions about the technologies that we're using actually kind of get either pushed out or pushed to the center and told just to be a service organization. And so while, yes, some of the, the innovation programs that we're seeing at institutions are continuing or even sometimes growing, I wonder if sometimes they're losing their edge and their critical side, um, which I think we really need, especially in the political climate that we'll be facing. Great. So much to reflect on. Uh, we do have a few minutes for conversation if anybody wants to jump in and respond to one of our panelists' thoughts. Well, I, I, so this is what I was let me, let me just um, just respond to that. I, I, I know I, I, I really appreciate everything that is being discussed. It's a rich conversation and so many of these comments can actually have their own discussions you know, separately. But the thing that I see is that when it comes to technology, whether it is data, whether it's tech, you know, whether it is really components or the use of it, the big question is: Are institutions really ready for this digital shift, or what do they need to do to really make themselves ready for the digital? Shift? These are digital shift. These are all the problems associated with understanding how to incorporate something new that obviously has huge benefits potentially and potentially has huge risks associated with it. So who drives it? How do you make it happen? What is it for? What does it bring to the table? Um, you know, we work best and we find the best results with institutions that have thought through some of that stuff and are willing to work through the process and it works really well from top to bottom uh, to make things happen. But in general, I mean, I think what would be interesting to develop would be a digital maturity model for institutions to say where are they in, in the span of digital maturity to move to the digital shift. It's going to happen. Um, it needs to happen. Um, it, it's a question of how exactly happens with every institution. But a lot of the issues that we see coming out of the institutions are really because of the lack of understanding and maturity in terms of how to handle, you know, uh, how to operate in a digital world. Other reflections, panelists, comments? Well, I, I, let me just add to that. Uh, the two examples I mentioned, um, by the way, I saw something on Twitter that called me Philly Anna, so I, I'll, 
I'll try to not be too positive. <laughs> um, I might have to but, use that. Um, yeah, I know. I'm going to be using it, trust me. Um, but in any case, uh, when you talk about being ready for like uh, digital learning and you know digital economy and, and be transformative from the institution, from the two examples I used, neither one of them came about because of careful planning from the beginning and then they step by step got to say, let's go ahead and take ownership and really make tougher choices. Both of them were triggered by painful external choices that they had to respond to. And I think that's quite often reality. The California I mentioned, there was the big Senate Bill 520 and the threat of outside providers, if you will, getting too directly involved. University of Florida was outside uh, funding through, you know, using an OPM and things really starting to fall apart. So, but once they did change and once, you know, when I say they, part of it's funding, part of it's a new organization, who the leadership is, then you can get onto, well, what's the maturity? How do we build the infrastructure so that we can take this and, this, uh, and, and go further? So I like what you're saying that, you know, they need to learn how to do it and there's a maturity model, but I don't think that it always gets started just, uh, you know, by careful planning. It's often some sort of painful exterior trigger, external trigger that makes it happen. Oh, no, no, and I completely agree with you, Phil, just, you know, just to give on that. I completely agree with you. The challenge always is what are the external pressures that until there is an external pressure, then you act. That doesn't sound like innovation. It sounds like, you know, being forced, you know, something that's sustainable on an innovation standpoint. What I'm talking about is not careful planning really somebody having the right organizational structure inside to be able to orchestrate all the pieces associated with it. That's where we find the biggest challenges in terms of, you know, who do you, who do you, things like who pays, who do you talk to, you know, who's really responsible for it, how do you make it happen. Uh, the, the, in, the internal aspects of it from an exploratory standpoint tend to be more from people who want to do it, to Amy's point, and they may or may not have a chance depending on, on the year as opposed to having a very carefully laid out strategy associated with it. You Megan. Can also, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Luke. No, I just, Amy brought up about the new administration that's coming in and, and the thing that I'm most interested to watch in the new administration is how rules making is handled because quite frankly, in the last at least four years, and we know from our own experience with our our friends at WCT and and those that we engage with, that you know uh, the the rules making and the advice and the knowledge that everyone on this call uh, collectively shares and then is carried forth by people invited to be on those committees has been ignored. Um, and you know I'm I'm anxious to see how this rules making uh, capacity changes, if it changes at all. I don't know, I don't have a, um, a, a predisposed opinion about will it change or how will it change. I'm also curious to see, you know, the, the focus on the for-profits in the last administration really had a spillover effect on everyone else. I mean, I know that there are things that I'm investing in now that I wasn't four years ago, uh, strictly based off of things that have come out of the, the dear colleague and, and the rules making process. And so, you know, those, that's one of the things I'm really going to be paying attention to. Um, you know, again, I don't have a comment one way or the other on good or bad, uh, but I do hope there is some change. Um, and you know, and, and wish we had our friend Russ Pullen to to have, give us some commentary on that because he certainly had some experience there. Absolutely, and I'm sure Russ will have some reflections. We had a conversation yesterday about whether or not we expect a lot of things to be shaken up with the new administration or not, and and that outcome of that discussion was thus far everything has been unpredictable and unpredicted so we'll just have to wait and see. Amy I want to give you a, a moment to respond. Oh sure and I think this will actually get us to your next question um, because I just kind of want to tie in a couple of threads here and say one of the things that I think will be really important at our institutions and it's something that we've seen addressed in various ways across various institutions in the last couple of years um, is going to be this notion of, of digital literacy. So this kind of gets us to your next question of what kinds of topics should we be addressing. Um, and, and in part because one of, one of the fears, one of the concerns I have about um, the ways in which we talk about the digital and its role in higher education is this kind of 
um, this tendency to view innovation for innovation's sake. You know, we must innovate, we must have innovation without really a clear sense of what, what it is that we're trying to innovate towards. Why are we innovating? What is innovation really doing for us? And the ability to ask critical questions about that innovation. What is that innovation actually doing that's negative? Um, what is it obscuring? What, is, what power dynamics is it creating or, or making more powerful? Um, and so for me, one of the big um, areas of, of topics of interest I have that I think a lot of our institutions will be exploring more is this notion of, of, of digital literacy, of understanding what does it mean to be a, a human being in a society that uses digital technologies in a variety of ways. Um, we've seen a lot of interesting work over the last couple of years about this topic. Um, I think of Chris Gilliard, um, who writes about digital redlining, about the idea of the ways in which some students are kept out of um, certain kinds of learning and certain kinds of innovation because of you know, things like socioeconomic status and race. Um, I think of uh, the work that Mike Caulfield is now doing with the ASCNU about digital polarization, about the idea of the ways in which digital is used to polarize our cultures and our people. And these are areas where it's bringing a critical lens to the notion of innovation in digital. And I think, you know, just to do, just to do innovation for innovation's sake becomes uh, really uncritical and, and pro problematic. Uh, and what I'd like to see more of is more discussions about digital agency and digital literacy and what does that mean for our students and for our institutions. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. That did lead directly into our final question. And so for the other panelists, what topics should we in higher ed be addressing but seem to be in, in denial? And uh, some that come to mind are accessibility and whether or not we're doing enough to make sure that we're in compliance. Um, another topic that comes to mind is also about security and privacy and the ownership of data now that so many institutions are data ready. Uh, let's let's jump to Phil on this. Well, um, and I'll pick up on your last one on the privacy. Uh, and, and I had written recently about um, a challenge that a lot of schools were going through with uh, with I won't mention the name because it's not the really the relevant part, but an LTI app provider on what they were doing with student data. And I think uh, I think it might have been Amy who said earlier, it's not the collecting; it's what do you do with the data afterwards. Um, and there was a real, very clear-cut case where the data was not being used properly and not, it wasn't following guidelines. There were some real problems. But I point this out as a big issue, not just because of generic privacy as a concern. It's because we are moving more and more into an integrated app type of mentality. It's not an overnight shift, but there's more and more apps getting patched together through integration frameworks, uh, various uh, trials, so there are different reasons. But when you don't have one primary system that most activity is being done in, that really makes it trickier. Well, what are the privacy policies there? What's happening with that data? Who, who are they sending it to? Do we even know? And it becomes even more difficult with all of the free apps that are out there, because when you're talking free, one way to read that is doesn't have to go through typical procurement cycles. So there might be just ad hoc adoption by faculty or students and nobody's really watching it. So that's a real thing that needs more attention moving forward. Or what are realistic privacy safeguards and policies or whatever the case may be in a world of integrated apps? Uh, well and said. Megan, I'm gonna. I was just gonna throw it to you, Luke, because I know you have to head out shortly. I I really want to support what um, Amy had to say, uh, but also from a different standpoint. We've heard for years that the online environment allows students who would never speak up in a classroom uh, to to have to voice their opinions. And I I think that the the work around digital literacy is making sure that we don't tread backwards on that uh, and, and that we move towards inclusion. And that means inclusion of all ideas and beliefs, no matter how offensive we find them. Um, and 
and that that work and that conversation that WCET started at the annual meeting this year is very important to me. I, it, it really uh, struck a chord with me. We've then engaged Capella University and, and hopefully we'll be inviting others around this topic of digital inclusion and, and certainly hope. I'm, I'm advocating here uh, that WCET is going to continue to build that work because I think there are some thinking and some resources and some strategies that are going to help us to maintain gains we've had and that's specifically in letting students explore what their voices look like uh, and sharing those and online learning certainly enabled us to do that but I, I see more and more behavior that that is runs counter to that and can be discouraging and that's why I'm, I'm interested in digital inclusion and and I'll kind of end my comments there. Thank you Luke and just from the WCET side I, I want to tell our audience that we had a session at our annual meeting on this topic and it, you can access it via our website it was recorded and this is a project and good work that we're going to take on with the help of our executive council and a subgroup of membership so be looking for resources to be rolled out on the topic of digital inclusion from us over the next year thank you Luke I know you have to duck off but let's jump to Manoj um, you know, I think a lot has been covered in it. If I really talk about what has not been, I think the 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 overarching point in here is really less to do. I would hope that we focus less on ed tech and we focus on understanding tech in ed. Um, you know, what does it really take for an institution to understand? All the things we're talking about are absolutely issues that almost every other sector has dealt with as they've tried to bring in technology into their into their sectors um, you know but but uh, but it almost seems like the university is the product for the for the student as opposed to you know what they're actually trying to learn and I would hope that you know the the the, the conversation shifts to what is really needed to provide for the students and technology is just a tool it's not technology innovation, it's educational innovation and how do you innovate you know while managing the risks and you know associated with it um, you know that really is the topic for institutions. I travel to a lot of institutions, I talk to them, um, we work with a lot of uh, folks and, and there are legitimate barriers inside an institution to make things happen. I think the conversation really needs to come up to do they believe in, in the role of technology in education and if so, what should be done to make that happen? Everything else are just point solutions that address one problem or the other. Excellent. So we have just a couple minutes for discussion, and then we'll jump to the audience questions. Any reflections, panel? I think we need to disagree with each other more. I'm trying to figure out which fight I can pick. I was going to pick a fight with you on adaptive learning, but that's a, that, let's have that in a different one. So how about that? <laughs> but I, I, I oh, also, sorry for agreeing. I love the phrase you just used, by the way, less focus on ed tech and more focus on tech and ed. I think that's a very good, good way of looking at it. I try, uh, well, while we were doing this, I, I did have one question. I'm not sure, uh, well, either Amy or Minoj. We're talking about how we, I think there's a consensus, we want schools to take more ownership of tech and ed and have more maturity. And I pointed, and I guess my argument is we have some things to watch. It's really interesting. But there's still the question, is it happening? Like, do you guys see a meaningful shift and institutions taking ownership of digital innovations? I do. I mean, uh, sorry, Amy, go ahead. Um, if, if. Oh, that wasn't me, but go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was Megan. Um, yeah, we do. I think this is where people uh, who are working on really understanding what this means and, and it comes in different places. I think people look for an opportunity to say when I'm introducing a new program do I need to do it? When you know I have a reason to do it, you know, that's so there has to be an internal reason to say this is the right time to make that happen 
but it we are seeing a Look, I think ed tech is going to remain in the in the space of people who are early adopters and progressives and who get it and are willing to organize the stuff. And I will tell you that you know large and small institutions that we are working with, the reason they are scaling, the reason they are expanding, is because they have organized themselves to make that happen. And we see that in small private regionals, we see that in large research universities, we see that in for profits, we see that in you know, smaller, you know, colleges associated with it. So there are examples of people who are doing this to, you know, in a very thoughtful way of understanding what needs to be done. There's no question that there is some bet that needs to be placed on the future in terms of what you want to bet on, because there's no, you know, there's no crystal ball that says this is absolutely going to work. But it's all based upon what problems they're really trying to solve and how they're applying technology towards it in terms of testing it, you know, proving the efficacy and, and growing with the stuff. Well, I think, too, it does matter, as you were just saying, Manoj, that the problem that they're trying to solve, um, there are certainly a lot of institutions that are still trying to solve major financial crises uh, with digital learning of some sort. And in those cases, and I'll agree with Tanya Justin, who on Twitter was talking about how at a lot of our institutions, it's much easier to do a one-time payment to a vendor to solve some problems for us, say, increasing enrollments in our online programs or um, changing over our learning management system from one vendor to another. Um, it's sometimes easier to write a one-time check to a vendor to do some of that kind of hard work that often, if you do it internally, requires greater cultural change, which takes time and which is often not cheap. And I think a lot of institutions are still making the decision to take the easier path or the, the quicker path or the less expensive path uh, and not investing internally but actually investing externally um, to, to make major change happen on their campuses. One of the big downsides of that, of course, as you imagine, is that you don't end up investing in people on the campus. And so the, the longevity of such investments uh, is pretty short and you end up a lot of times inheriting new problems. Um, so I think there's, there's work to be done in discussing how to build capacity at our institutions to do the kind of work we want to see happen. Um, I think every institution probably has a different answer for that. I know Middlebury has a different answer than another institution might have. Um, and it, but I think it really, for, for people in, in leadership roles like many of us are, we have to sit down and think seriously about what it means to build the right capacity or institutions to do the right kinds of things at our institution with digital. And if we have those hard conversations, um, usually we can make an, an argument to the people who make decisions about how the money gets spent about whether or not to invest in internal teams or in vendors. Excellent. And, and I'm going to touch on that topic when we get further into this slide deck about our upcoming leadership summit, because we are hoping to tackle some of those big questions. But let's jump to audience, audience questions. We have a few and about seven minutes remaining. Linda Bush has a question to the panelists about virtual reality applications for learning experiences. Are, are they starting to take hold, or is that uh, more so on the periphery? It's too bad Luke's gone. I think Luke I has uh, done some work on that. Um, I Well, I'll answer from my standpoint. It, it, I, where I see that is only in sort of R&D, almost you know, basic science exploration. So when I hear the phrase taking off or really going somewhere, I see some individual uh, programs exploring with it, and it's pretty interesting to think about it. But I certainly think that's very, very early on. And, no program I've seen is like gonna is anywhere close to scaling or really showing that it works. So it's more in the research. Let's see what the possibilities are mode from what I've seen. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I was just gonna say really briefly that I've seen it implemented on kind of a a really small scale level in an individual class, and it's a really expensive technology to invest in at that level. Um, I haven't seen an implementation that would um, sell me on its impact on a, on, a, on a broader scale yet. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, I think just to add to that, the, the, the issue is not the technology because it's available. The issue is the content. 
um, it's like having a 4K TV, but but no one actually producing content with it. And and how do you produce the content? For what do you produce? And who produces it? Is still a question. So it's going to remain in that experimentation domain for now until it becomes clear in terms of. I actually believe in it hugely. I actually think that it is something that's going to happen over time because it's an immersive experience to give people. But how do you orchestrate the entire learning, the instruction, and the curriculum and the content around it? to do that is, is something that people are still trying to solve. So I don't think it's the technology, it's the application of it and what needs to happen in an educational context that still needs to be worked out. We'll get to one more question from the audience. This one's from Jim Holton. Do you see the idea of boot camps related to the trend of badges in education? Amy, you want to take that one? Um, Badges, I don't actually have a ton of experience with, with badges, so I probably wouldn't be able to speak um, to that very broadly. Yeah, unfortunately, with Luke gone, I, I know he could address some of this as well from the institutional perspective. What about you, Phil or Manoj? Uh, I actually see it a little bit different. You know, when I think, you know, badges might be a part of it, but when I think badges, quite often you get to the whole unbundling and breaking apart different you know, where you sh can show that you've gained certain uh, skills or knowledge. But boot camps are sort of like an alternative path, um, you know, and it's still, okay, I went to this boot camp. So there may be a badge associated with it, but I don't think the badging movement, like, drove coding boot camps. I think those the right way to view those. And as Luke pointed out, you know, the jury's out and it's something that needs careful evaluation. I think those were driven by a different initiative. It's just that badges may be a way to signify that you've done it. So I don't see them too closely related from my view. Yeah, I don't see it closely related either. What I do see is that badges is nothing more than an articulation um, uh, technique, you know, where if you do want the ability to to articulate to a greater detail, there are many ways to do that, but it's really evolving the transcript and understanding what the value of you know something that's a little smaller and, and micro compared to a grade um, or or degree you know means to that. So I, I'm not really sure. In fact, I would say that the boot camp is the exact opposite of a badge because you know it's really an alternative model where you're trying to work on one thing. And I also think that boot camp is more of an edge pedag you know, it's it's a it's a it's a product that is not something that's an alternative to what's being done, but it's just another technique to kind of figure out how to get people to where they need to in in possibly a manner that's different than how traditional stuff happens. So I don't see them related, but I see badges as I do I'm not that big on, on badges because you have to understand so what is the value of a badge and to whom. And until that gets figured out, the question becomes, why would you articulate using badges? Excellent. In the last remaining minutes that we have here as a group, I want to throw it to each of our panelists to take about 30, 45 seconds to give any final thoughts on what you anticipate or what we should be looking for in 2017, starting with Amy. So it's definitely not a, a leading edge technology or even a bleeding edge technology, but I certainly am continuing to follow uh, the domain of one's own uh, um, um, and the initiatives to give students spaces of their own that they control, that they manage the privacy of, that they manage the intellectual property of, that, that instills in students a sense of agency over the spaces they use online. Um, I think that that's a powerful initiative and a really important one, and uh, one that we're doing here at Middlebury. And um, I hope that it becomes a way in which we have better conversations about how to help students in the political climate that we're about to face. Excellent. And Philiana? <laughs> actually, I'm not going to be Philiana. I'll actually pick up on the big news of yesterday was Pearson's massive stock drop which was driven by how slow the next generation, the digital courseware, is getting adopted. And I'm not saying that's the answer for all questions, but I think there's a big question about the timeliness of adoption and what that impact has on what's happening within systems. So for vendors, 
how does that affect their their business models and ability to be patient and let the tech serve the ad? Because um, I think that there's a real risk that's happening based on timing. And you see one company getting punished for being overly aggressive on when things would transform. Um, so I, I think, and then from the school perspective, I think uh, Amy mentioned this, something similar where she's seen some MOOCs drive some uh, innovative uh, work within schools, but then there's a little bit of a pullback, almost you lose your you know, momentum. So I think uh, patience is a big thing to watch for and how can that be harmful uh, or what do we need to watch for based on trying to be patient. Terrific. And Manoj, we are at the top of the hour, but please give us your final thoughts. Um, I, you know, I think I would have, I would just add to what Phil has said. I mean, it's really from an institutional perspective, you know, having the courage and the persistence. Uh, and from uh, a supplier community standpoint, having the collaboration and partnership with institutions, even if it means it's select institutions, to work with them to, to focus. My thing in 2017 is to see more learner-centered paradigms you know, evolve that will drive, you know, tech and ed, as opposed to, you know, trying to try every single ed tech that's out there. Excellent. Well, thank you to all of our panelists today, Amy, Phil, Manoj, and Luke. This was a fascinating conversation. It was recorded. I'll send the link out to all of the registrants, and it will be available on the WCET website within the next week. I, for one, can't wait to listen as a participant and, and glean a little more because this was such a meaty conversation and I really appreciate all of the thoughtful comments and the questions from the audience. So thank you all for joining us today. Do pay attention to upcoming events and programs here at WCET. We're planning a great first half of the year, so stay tuned. Our next webcast is February 16th on understanding and implementing a content strategy. Thank you again to our supporting members and our WCET annual sponsors. A final thank you to our audience and our fantastic group of panelists. Thanks so much. Bye all. <laughs>